All right, we're recording. Thank you all again for being here this morning. Uh, again, I'm Rita. Uh, we have our ESCA Small But Mighty team today, um, and you are in the November office hours. These are recorded um, and will be up online on our resources page. Travis. All right, good morning, everyone. Hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so just a couple of friendly reminders here with regard to the um, ESCA performance report for FY23. Um, that is now um, due or uh, I guess past due at this point, uh, became due on November 1st. Um, I was in there uh, in the system this morning, just kind of browsing to see, get a sense of where folks are at in terms of submission. Um, we do have about 80 or so SAUs right now who are somewhere in the process of submitting those performance reports. Um, so if you're not 100% certain where your uh, district submission is in process, I would encourage you to go in and take a look. Um, there seem to be quite a few folks that um, might have uh, submitted as an ESEA coordinator, but whom um, haven't had their business manager or superintendent sign off on their submission yet. Um, so please make sure that you're kind of keeping a pulse on that and um, contacting uh, members of your admin team if you need help moving that forward. Um, Again, just a couple of, of quick things here to remind folks of as you uh, get into performance reports and begin to um, complete and submit those, uh, you want to make sure that your um, billing uh, for FY23 funds is completed through September 30th of um, 2023 before uh, basically going in to complete all of your expense reporting for the performance report. Um, simply because those figures that you report need to line up with what's in the reimbursement system as of that September 30th end date. So if your billing's not there yet, your financial reporting is going to be held up a little bit until um, your business office can get caught up. Um, as I mentioned, there are quite a few uh, submissions that are somewhere in limbo right now. They've, they've you know, been completed, but not yet fully certified by the district. Um, and that doesn't happen until that final superintendent sign-off occurs. Um, and then just lastly here, we do have um, some training resources available on our website for any folks that uh, may be new or may be doing the performance report for the first time. Um, we encourage you to um, leverage that resource to go there and review the materials. Um, and then if you have any follow-up questions, you're of course always welcome to reach out to your uh, regional program manager for additional support. All right, and then for those who have been around for a while and are, are kind of used to doing our performance reports here, there are a couple of um, changes this year that I just, I wanna reiterate for folks. Um, the first being that when it comes to reporting out on school and district level goals, um, the goals that would have been previously entered into your FY23 application now auto populate um, in the appropriate performance report pages. It's no longer a process where you have to kind of copy and paste that information yourself. Um, the system takes care of that for you. Um, we do also for our um, SAU partners that have non-public schools, we have an updated um, non-public school reconciliation form um, that basically has to do with any uh, potential carryover funds uh, that may be um, available as part of equitable services for your non-public schools. Um, and so just be cognizant of that. If you've not already started those conversations uh, about how to handle carryover funds that might exist for some of your non-public schools, um, this year, there is a much higher burden of proof um, for them to be able to uh, demonstrate that it's necessary for them to have uh, carryover or access to um, those equitable services funds for essentially another 12 months. Um, so again, just something to be cognizant of. Um, we also have a new uh, supplemental data page specific to the Title IV-A program. Um, if you're at, within a school district that actually leverages Title IV funds for Title IV purposes. Uh, there's a couple of questions here just asking about the extent to which you've met kind of some of your um, intended uh, outcomes for the, the use of Title IV funds. Um, if you're in a situation where 
your district has essentially transferred most or all of your funds out of Title IV, it's simply a matter of just going into those pages and, and selecting not applicable. Um, and then lastly, you know, as, as kind of we've had more and more of uh, waivers from the federal government, we've now finally reached the time point in time where FY21 uh, awards are needing to be closed out. Um, and so that is kind of one of the last things that will need to be done as part of uh, basically your submission for the FY23 performance report. So um, just to kind of give folks a, a brief synopsis of what you would actually do to close out FY21, uh, you'd essentially go into your 21 application, create a new revision um, to your previously existing performance report, uh, and then you're just going into your individual project pages and updating the project-based expense reporting uh, to align with how funds were ultimately spent. So we're at a point in time now where FY21 should be fully expended, and then it's just a matter of going in to do that final update on FY21 to report out on where funds were finally expended against your projects. And then um, just a quick reminder for folks, because we have been getting quite a few questions around this. Um, if you have successfully submitted a performance report uh, for the ESEA team and you've received a uh, notification that your regional program manager has returned that submission to you for edits. Um, what you would need to do is go into your the 23 performance report uh, and then pull up the consultant checklist. Uh, this is the page of the performance report where you're going to find uh, feedback on certain aspects or pieces of your performance report that may need updating, revising, correcting, what have you. Um, one thing I want to point out is that by default, uh, this will basically just be a list of items with a status next to each different page. Um, if you see a particular page or set of pages where there's a uh, needs attention uh, status, you're going to want to click the plus arrow next to that item. And what that's going to do is expand that um, box for that item. And you can see from the screenshot here, there'll be a, a narrative text box um, where you'll have feedback from Ryan, Rita, um, Dan, Jess, or myself. Um, so again, just be cognizant of that. If you're not sure what you need to do to, to update and resubmit your performance report, make sure you visit that consultant checklist uh, and then make sure you're expanding those text boxes for any items that are flagged as need attention. Thanks, Travis. And before you move on from this, one thing I know that I've done with some of my districts, and I think Ryan and I've talked about this a bit, I don't want to confuse folks, but I do know that for some performance report review items that need attention, they're not actually necessary in the application itself. So I'm thinking of in districts that just need to finish invoicing or districts that just need to close out FY21, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and I've been calling or emailing districts to let them know I'm actually not returning it to your queue because there's nothing in the application itself that needs to be changed. Um, and instead, rather than go through the whole workflow again, please go into the consultant checklist, press the plus button, check out what I did say, and still uh, rectify those. And then communicate with your regional program manager to let them know you are done with invoicing, you have closed out FY21 because that can speed up the process to getting your performance report approved. So I did, there's caveats with performance reports. I just wanted to bring that up. For the most part, if application expenditures still have to be reported, you will see those return for additional edits and that will be in your queue. All right. Good morning, folks. As Travis mentioned, one of the changes in the PR is tied to the non-public reconciliation form. And we made these changes because we received new guidance from the U.S. Department of Ed, really everyone across the country did on July 17th, on equitable services in general. Uh, we hope to do a training on equitable services working with our non-public folks sometime this winter. But for right now, for the performance report, what we want to draw your attention to is from the guidance item B10, I believe someone just did this in the chat if you want to go read all of these yourself. But what item B10 really explained is that carryover for equitable services should really be the exception and not the rule. 
And of course, during the pandemic, especially early on, we were pretty flexible with our non-public folks, just like we tried to be with all of you folks in allowing that sort of extra grace to use up these funds. But what B10 tells us is there are a few reasons why a non-public school can have carryover for their equitable services. And so we're asking for a bit more detail this year under options A and B, which I know it's probably a little small on your screen, but you can see here from the screenshot. Um, item A talks about services being delayed due to extenuating circumstances like natural disasters or you know, if they aren't able to find qualified employees. I know we heard from one school that couldn't find subs to be able to give teachers time to go observe each other. Right, those sort of situations. Simply saying we didn't have enough time is probably not enough detail for us to approve that sort of carryover situation. And I know at least in the forms I've seen lately, um, that's that's all kind of we're getting. Folks are used to the old like grace and being able to say, well, pandemic, we didn't have enough time. We really need a bit more detail than that. Option B is a an even more kind of specific reason, an under budget carryover justification where Equitable services have been provided. The bill basically came in under budget, but it came in so late, you didn't have time to use up the rest of the funds, right? You didn't have time to consult further. So when I think about that, you know, reasonable timeline, if your equitable services were provided in July and August, and that bill from whoever was providing those equitable services came to the district, you know, a week or two before September 30th, there wasn't enough time to consult to use up the rest. So B is a very specific situation where A, there are a couple of different scenarios that could play out that would allow for carryover. And in both cases, something that's key here is sort of the second part, the last part of these sentences, and additional need for funds still exists. Because our non-public schools get new sets of equitable service funding every single year, there has to be some additional need that's being filled by this carryover. And so they have to articulate what that is. And so this does require a bit more detail. And it's one of the reasons why I believe this is a Microsoft Word document so they can type and kind of expand those boxes if they need to, to provide us or even add another attachment somewhere, you know, either part of this file or in the history log so that we can kind of see that more detailed justification than just saying we need more time. Another thing we're noticing uh, that I'm having to write a lot with my performance reports is one of the things we need to do every year is close out whatever grant is winding up. So in this case, FY21 funds had to have been obligated by September 30th. You have until the end of December to liquidate those funds. I would do that sooner rather than later. I'm sure Tyra is probably going to echo this in a few minutes, but want to make sure that in case there are any hiccups along the way, you get that uh, liquidation done now rather than waiting until the end of December. So to close out FY21, FY21 was the first grant year that got converted into grants for me. So if you had carryover funds that were spent after the performance report was submitted for FY21, you're gonna go start a revision for FY21 and add in those expenditures on all the project expenditure pages. And what we'll wanna see just like with the performance report is that the billing system, the invoicing system lines up with what you've reported for expenditures. So if you spent all your FY21 funds, we'll see that in the project expenditure pages. The totals will line up and we'll see that there's no balance left. You submit that revision, we check it off, we have a status now that says grant closeout approved and FY21 is taken care of. Ryan, and if, for instance, a district has gone in and reported what they think is all expenditures, but they wanna check, where should they go in the application to see what the expenditures say for their full application? So at the very bottom of the sections page on any application and grants from me, at least for ESEA, there is a project totals by grants page. And there's also, I believe, an expenditure summary page. So the first one would be the expenditure summary, and it compares the invoicing system versus what you've reported. So in a perfect world, there's then a column that, that reports out the difference that would show all zeros because what you've reported matches what's been invoiced. Sometimes folks might get the object or the function code just slightly wrong and that'll throw that off. So what we really try to focus on when we're doing our review is if that project totals by grant page matches what the invoicing system says. So if you said, I, I think yesterday I saw someone that had $27 left in Title V, 
I want to be able to go into the invoicing system, see zeros next to titles one, two, three, and four, and $27 remaining in title five. And that's where a bunch of my districts, for those on the call, I screenshot both pages. I screenshot the invoice page for you, and I screenshot the project totals by grant, even though that's not where you put the information in. I'm showing you what I see and where the discrepancy is, if it's in Title I or Title II. And that's where you kind of have to know your projects and know where you spent those funds in the appropriate titles. So that's often, those are often the reasons why those get kicked back. Yes. And sometimes, like, if I see a project totals by grant, if I go to that page and I see a number in parentheses, that means you've reported spending more funds than you actually were allocated, which we know the invoicing system doesn't allow. So that was that's an error somewhere that needs to be corrected, right? That's kind of an easy one to spot. Great. All right, moving on from the performance report. Those of you who are in the medium or high support status for fall monitoring, we have completed our initial review of all the items that were submitted in that fall window. So to view those findings, if you haven't already, you wanna to go to the monitoring instrument and grants for me. You change your status to LEA results review started. And at the bottom of the page you have, or the bottom of the sections page, there's a monitoring results LEA response page. So on there, you'll see our feedback on each item and they're color coded. So green is meets, yellow is meets with recommendation, red is does not meet. And there are any action steps you might need to complete. If you are a meets with recommendations and you just need to acknowledge sort of best practices that main DOE has provided, there's just a little confirmation box you're going to check that says you've received this feedback and agree to implement these changes. If you have some documentation you need to upload, there's a little pencil icon you click on and that allows you to upload those new files. And so those next steps, you should see the due date right in there, but sort of as a reminder for folks, we want them in by November 30th. Some of these may just be a plan. So if you have to put in place a board policy, as you all know, that's a lengthier process than something you're gonna get done maybe in the span of a month or a couple of weeks. So we just usually in that case, ask for a plan, maybe see the rough draft, and then we'll give you the extension to do the final actual policy once the board votes to approve it. All right, and I believe the last thing I have for folks today is tied to professional development. So as many of you know, we spent some time with our partners at the US Department of Ed this spring being monitored here at the state level. And one thing for Title II they really focused on is the definition of professional development and how it has to be defined as something that's evidence-based as well as sustained. And they specifically call out not standalone one day or short-term workshops. It needs to be intensive, collaborative, job embedded, data-driven, and classroom focused. That is a mouthful, but I'm getting better at rattling it off every day. Um, and I wanna point out that this uh, professional development definition is something that comes from section 8,000, which is the definitions. And so it really applies to all titles. But for uh, our sake, Title II being kind of the professional development title is really where the focus comes in from our friends at the federal government. So as we're thinking about how we spend those funds, we want to kind of be pushing folks in that direction of things that are more sustained and long-term. Um, things like coaching, for example, or PLCs versus sending folks off to one-day workshops. At the very least, when we look at those kind of expenses that are maybe fit under that short term, not standalone category, we want to see them at least be part of a larger, more systematic effort, right? If you have a staff member who is in your, um, your teacher growth model and part of their growth plan involves uh, improving classroom development, one step might be something that you would otherwise define as short short term, you know, a workshop or a, a one day session. But we want to see it be part of a larger plan to show that it's more of a long term job embedded collaborative process and not just, hey, so and so wanted to go to a conference. We just said we have title two. So we said yes. This is a bit of a mindset shift for a lot of folks and not just here in Maine, but around the country. This is something that has always been part of ESSA but that the US Department of Ed is really focusing on now wanting to make sure folks make that shift because statute does say that professional development should be sustained, intensive, collaborative, job embedded, data driven, and classroom focused.
moving on oh. to fiscal Tyra. Good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to announce that we are going to hold federal fiscal office hours where there will be a represent representative from um, all of our federal programs is the goal. This way, this is structured with the business manager in mind. So please share this information with your business managers. The very first one will be November 30th at 10 a.m. And I have provided a link that you can register um, for that particular office hour. Next slide. All right, substantial approval. We've beat this to death, I think, but I do want to remind folks that the date of substantial approval is not necessarily the first date an application is submitted. And substantial approval um, impacts the first invoice uh, for new funds. So in this case, we're talking about FY24. Um, and if you are splitting an invoice, substantial approval will also impact that as well. It impacts your period of performance which we'll get to in just a minute. Okay, so this is how you can find your substantial approval date if you're uh, specifically a business manager. When you're going to put in a new um, invoice, the very first on the left-hand side of the screen is your a picture of your menu that comes up on your home screen if you click on invoices and then you choose which title that you want to put um put the request in for the very next page that comes up is your project summary page which is on the far right of this screen i have um put it in a red box and that's your substantial approval date Technically, the system should not allow you to put in a billing period prior to that date. However, some people put in the substantial approval date, but the backup indicates that um, the expenses were incurred prior to that date. Next screen. Uh, uh, yes, Ryan was right. I am gonna talk a little bit about the liquidation period for FY21 funds. Your FY22 tier three school improvement funds. And if you received FY23 pilot innovative grant, they all have the same liquidation period. Now keep in mind that if you obligated funds in September, but the event, or conference or travel isn't gonna take place until November, those expenses would not be eligible for uh, reimbursement under the FY21 grant. Next screen. Okay, so splitting invoices between two grant years, both uh, invoices must be for the same billing period. So you're going to submit an FY23 invoice for, let's say, um, October 1st, 2023 to October 30th, 2023. There needs to be an, if you're going to split the expenses because you don't have, say, salary and benefits is a big one. You don't have enough funds in the FY23 um, to re get reimbursement for all the salary and benefits for that billing period. And it fits, it's all allocable to the FY24 application and it fits, you can split your invoices. But you must, must be able to, for the expenses to be allocable to both grant your applications fall and fall within the period of performance for both grant years. If you have any questions about that, just um, send me an email or put it in chat. Obligations. 
So accrued salaries cannot be reimbursed using current year funds. What does that mean? That means for school year 22-23, the earned salaries, which were accrued because the teacher or staff member has um, opted for 26 pay periods, so they're being paid through the summer, those salaries need to be paid with FY23. They cannot be paid with FY24. Any contractual services should not be entered into until after the substantial approval date of your application. And the link provided is from um, Edgar. And here it is. This is the link for obligations. For the most part, ESEA needs to be concerned with B, C, D, and F. And there are times when you're looking at an expense as one thing, but it may fall under um, two different categories when it comes to obligation. Uh, for instance, um, traveling to a professional development conference, right? So the registration um, may fall under D, but the travel is going to fall under F, and we do not reimburse until after the fact for either one of those. So after the conference has been attended or the travel has been taken, that's when we can reimburse. So in this in that um, scenario, you need to make sure that both the obligation date and the date of the event is within the period of performance of the grant that you wish to reimburse with. Next. This is just a friendly reminder of um, your dates for the grants that you could possibly be receiving funds with. Obviously, the important ones are F um, FY22, school improvement, FY23, um, pilot innovative. And I just noticed I don't have FY21 ESEA on there, but that is also in the um, liquidation period. Next. Reimbursement for equitable services. The public SAU must maintain control of funds at all times. A payment should never be made directly to the non-public. Payment can be made directly to the private school staff member if it's reasonable and necessary, and it's for time spent outside of their regular employment hours. All right, so that was it for fiscal. <laughs> Just a couple housekeeping things, Tyra. Uh, again, yeah, someone in the chat did mention, Tyra, just wanted you to hear that positive feedback about a federal fiscal office hours. Uh, so very excited about that. I'm sure the field will appreciate that. I'm here as a representative for Andrea Logan, our MTSS specialist at the department, because she's been hosting office hours. Uh, she did let me know that they're the first, second, and third of the month, so just not the last Tuesday of the month. Um, the registration, if someone can pop that in, I do see is for today at 3.30. Um, so it is those Tuesdays. Um, and I, my understanding is really it's drop-in, it's this is what we're trying to do in our school, this is um, a place to get ideas from other districts and other school leaders. So um, we're gonna kind of continue to remind you guys this exists just given the school improvement intersection, as well as I know many are working on um, MTSS tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions. So um, she could be a great resource and that group can be a great resource. Um, so we'll leave that there. And then um, our upcoming, we always like to remind folks, it's going to be December 12th. That's the second Tuesday of the month. The Tuesday prior, you'll receive a newsletter, uh, which you know we will go over. Uh, in our office hours in more detail. Our contact information is always on the website as well as here and on the newsletter, just so you can never lose us. Uh, professional learning calendar, and I do believe FTSS office hours actually live on that as well. 
uh, is available to you. Thank you, Renee, for popping all the links in the chat. So helpful today to have that. Um, and now it's it's the really fun part where you guys get to uh, get what you need from us. So thank you for following along. Um, yeah, folks can chat or, or come off mute if they feel comfortable to do so.